barracking for a football team. Go, Go, guys. Go, Go guys. Where do I hear Magpies? Magpies somewhere? Magpies. Yes, yes, yes. Barracking for a football team is really personal. And 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 you could never force someone to barrack for a football team by threatening violence, could you? Well, maybe you could. Because, see, Mr Brown thought he could. Mr Brown was my, prep, uh, my, my primary school teacher in grades five and six. And he threatened the whole class, if we did not barrack for Collingwood, we would get the strap. Now, he had this leather strap called Horace. And I can't explain exactly, but Horace and I had this relationship and we didn't like each other. And when we did meet each other, it, it hurt, right? And I don't know how, but the whole class, we all barracked for Collingwood. And I still barrack for Collingwood to this day, right? Um, but the biggest influence Mr Brown had on my life was not who I barrack for. Mr Brown believed that teaching children how to spell was unnecessary because he believed that it's just something you'd pick up in life as you went along. I'm here to tell you that Mr Brown was wrong. I'm terrible at spelling. Right? <laughs> don't. I, I can self-confess. You don't have to add to it, right? But a few weeks ago, I... I spoke about, now I even wrote it up on the whiteboard, this ancient Greek word called hupo, right? And I spelled it H-O-O-P-O. That's not how you, that's how you pronounce it. It's actually spelled H-U-P-O. If you spell it the other way and you do a Google search, which some of you did, this is what you come up with. So those in the van, can you put this up on the screen now? That's what you come up with. That's, that's a hoopo, right? That is not what I was talking about. I, I, if, if you spell it correctly and you take this ancient Greek word, that's not what it means. It actually means to come under. But it's not just a word. It's actually a concept. It's, it's this powerful concept that if, if we can get it, it will bring health and wholeness to our our walk in life as a Christian, and and if we can if we can run to this thing called hupo, and not away from it, we we come under kingdom authority, and in, and then in a Christian life, supernatural signs and wonders, power, it just it just works, it just it's normal part of life, and and Jesus promised that, but he didn't just promise it. He actually modelled what this thing would look like. Now, he did it in a way that you would not expect. Now, I have never walked from Bansdale to Rosedale. It's about 100 k's. I've, I've got a car, right? But, but if you were to walk, how long do you think it would take? Just someone, a number. 20 hours? Two, 20 hours? Four days? Yep. Well... What if it was hilly and rocky and not just a straight line? Because from here to Rosedale is pretty flat. But if it was hilly and rocky and you couldn't just go to, like, I don't know, three days, four or five days, I don't, I don't know. But Matthew tells us something in Chapter 3 of Matthew that's really important because he puts it in there to paint a picture. And this is what he tells us. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to get baptised by John. He came from Galilee to the Jordan, about 100 k's. You don't spend three or four or five days getting there and then getting back and, and, and sleeping in the dirt on the way there just to have a chat with your cousin. You'd email him, you'd text him, you'd, you'd ring him up, you'd... You'd do something on Facebook. You, you wouldn't walk that distance. So what was the reason that Jesus went? Well, Matthew tells us to be baptised by John. Now, John 
is six months older than Jesus. And both are now 30 years of age. And under Jewish culture and the way they did things, you couldn't become a rabbi, which meant master teacher, until you were 30 years old. It's why Jesus waited till he was 30 to put down the tools, stop being a tradie, and to do something very different with his life. But when he was 12, he knew what God had called him to do. He, he had an understanding. He, he, like, when his parents lost him for three days, he knew where he was meant to be. I don't know how you would feel, but God gave Mary only just one task. Raise my son. Don't lose him. She lost him. How do you explain to God, sorry, God, great privilege raising Jesus, but we lost him. (laughs) I don't know where he is. But see, Jesus knew where he was and he says, I am in my father's house. That's, That's where I was meant to be. That was when he was 12. By the time he's 30, he's had 18 more years to understand the the heart of the Father, to to minister to God in in prayer and receive back from God. This relationship has just gone deeper and deeper for the next 18 years. And he knows his purpose on planet Earth. He knows the the power that what God has put within him. He knows his ministry gift, his, his call, what he's meant to do. 6.30 6.30 this morning, I was sound asleep. I got a text message. I didn't notice it. I had my phone on silent. 7 o'clock, I, I, I could hear this little bzzz, 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 bzzz. And it was you, Dave, ringing me. 7 o'clock Sunday morning. Happy Sunday, Lex. Amy's crook as a dog and can't preach. But see, as humans, we plan things. But God is ahead of what's going on. And I never, never, never have a message ready to go. But I did for this Sunday. <laughs> and see, we, we plan things. But, but this, this message today isn't just a message. It's actually somebody needs to hear this because it's going to be really helpful for you. This might be the only time you're ever in the room or, or you're watching live the first time, and it's a message that God wants us to look at today. He didn't make Amy crook, but he had a, had a message to go. I have no idea where I am in my notes. So Jesus, he knew... <laughs> what he was here for. And he comes to John, 100 k's away. Why? See, John is, John is preaching this message about repentance and, and publicly dunking people, baptising in the Jordan River. Now, nowhere ever does God do things just purely as a ritual, as a symbol Baptism is one of those things that makes no sense to the human mind. But God instigated it as part of our Christian experience because it has a purpose. And so at some stage in the next few weeks, I'm hoping we're going to put a little baptism pond out there. We're going to dunk some people and let God do his stuff because it's not just symbolic. I have a friend who's a pastor in Sydney and he used to play NRL. And he was a really hard sort of bloke. A blokey, blokey, bloke, 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 you know. He had tattooed on, his, on this hand, on, on his fingers, the word love. And on this one, he had the word hate on his, on his fist, you see. And then in his mid-twenties, he got, became a Christian. And he got baptised. And... And when he went down the water, when he came back out, the tattoo hate was gone. Now, I tell you that is true, but I struggle to believe it. But I've seen his hand. And it's got love on these fingers and hate, that tattoo is just gone. His wife tells me it's true. He's a, he's a preacher. I believe him. 
<laughs> um, that's more than just getting wet. There's, there's something to this that's beyond what you can even just see on the outside. And, and so Jesus, he turns up to John, but he doesn't need baptism for sin because he's without sin. So what's he doing there? Hi, Charlie. Hey, Charlie, how'd you go up Central Australia? Was that you with Ray Martin and all those big knobs? Yeah. You're amazing. Jumped on a plane, went to Central Australia to, to be part of this big gig up there. and Fantastic. We'll catch up later. Yeah. Um, so why did Jesus, why did Jesus come to John? He needed something that John had. And in the very last two verses of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, there's a prophecy. And then 400 years go by and we hear nothing from God. There's, there's, there's almost nothing going on for 400 years. And then we find a priest at the start of the New Testament called Zechariah. And dear old Zach and his little wife Liz have never had children. She's infertile. They're old. And it looks like she could never have children. But she's been praying for a child. And both are faithfully serving God in their capacities. Zachariah is a priest in the temple. Never underestimate the fruit that comes from faithfulness. Faithfully serving God. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Praying for this child. It's just a normal Sunday at Red Gum. Ben's doing its stuff. And somehow Zachariah has this encounter supernaturally with God through an angel. And the angel says, I'm here because your prayer, the answer to your prayer is on the way. Your wife is going to become pregnant. And she's going to give birth to a son. You're going to call him John. And he's going to be the answer to the prophecy in Malachi 400 years earlier. 400 years go by and then a, a child is born. And the angel says, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. See, John will be the last of the prophets in the old style of the old covenant, where God appointed a prophet. He would be the bridge between Jesus who, who would establish a new covenant, a new way of doing things. So what was Jesus doing coming to John? What was he coming for? He was looking for an authority to hupo, to come under. See, Jesus knew the call upon his life. He knew the power that he'd been given. But he also knew that authority is a lot more important than power. Power is the ability, it's the capacity to change things. Don't miss this. Authority is the legal right for that power to function. A couple of weeks ago when I was speaking on Hoopo, I mentioned Martin Bryant. Martin Bryant had the power of a gun in his hand and he used that power against unarmed people, innocent people. He did not have the legal right to use the power that he did. And any abuse through church leadership whether that be spiritual abuse, physical abuse that's happened through historically through the Catholic churches and other churches, whether that be manipulating people, controlling people, that is a legal power operating without hoopo, without coming under kingdom authority. You can be powerful and illegal. 
And the fruit of that is always bad news. So Jesus went looking for John to baptise him. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 14, he says to him, But John tried to deter Jesus. See, John knew that Jesus had power. But John didn't really have a full grasp of the difference between power and authority. See, power can be really, it can be really obvious and it can be easily seen. And it appears as people's giftings, it, it, it's something that's on someone's life, um, it's their talents, it's their abilities. It's like that little X factor that some people have that you can see it, it's just so obvious. We are drawn to power. As human beings, we're drawn to power. Shane Warne had this amazing capacity to spin a cricket ball. But he wasn't... He, he would have made a brilliant captain for Australia. He was aggressive. He, he, he would have been a brilliant captain, but he wouldn't come under authority. Even his own personal life was out of control. But he had this gift that elevated him. Because we, we're drawn to power. We, we see it, but authority, is, it's, it's not so obvious. And John's response to Jesus is, actually, Jesus, I, I need to be, be baptised by you. You got the power. But Jesus goes, it's not how it works. You got the authority. And Jesus says to him, Let it be done so now. It is proper for, for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And John agreed. Righteousness, it's it's a funny word. We, we don't use that in common chat. Hey Zeke, you feeling righteous, mate? We, we just don't do it, do we, right? But, but Matthew picks this word that's translated righteousness because what it means is to carry, is, is to have a correct way of thinking. John isn't thinking correctly. He's thinking, no, I need to be baptised by you. But Jesus is saying, ah, it's not, that's not going to happen. I want you to think correctly about this. It's, it's an alignment with God's way. Of doing things. Now, watch what happens as power in Jesus is legally released as John baptizes him. As Jesus comes under John's authority, watch what happens. The Holy Spirit, like a dove. Doves don't flap like a like a dove. And and comes on Jesus. Now, Jesus was already full of the Holy Spirit. But now there's a whole new anointing on his life as he's come under John's authority. And then this voice from heaven speaks, and it's God. He's saying, this is my son, and I'm pumped. I'm so proud of him. This is me boy. But he wasn't, God wasn't speaking to Jesus, he's speaking to the crowd. See, when we come under God's authority, God promotes. God promoted Jesus. Jesus didn't have to. When we hoopo, when we, when, we, when we run to this thing, when we don't run away from it, and God promotes, Amy was going to be preaching this morning. Do you know, Amy has never, ever asked to preach in red gum. This morning, different people were playing different little things. Philip was up here on keyboard. Philip has never, ever asked to lead worship here. Because, see, God promotes. When we come under God's kingdom authority, God raises people, releases people. And, and then when you have this authority, which Philip has when he's song leading, he, he can lead any song he likes. Mandy, 
you lead any song you like this morning, right? You have that authority, but it's, it, it's a releasing of power. It's a releasing of gifting. Now, don't get me wrong. It's really great to volunteer. <laughs> we need lots of people volunteering, just putting a hand up and saying, pick me, like I'll do anything. It's great to be part of something bigger than ourselves. But it's, that's different to promoting yourself. Only then was Jesus ready to face what the enemy would throw at him. And I find it really sad when I see Christians that run away from coming under and, and they're vulnerable to the enemy's lies, the enemy's attack, because Jesus wasn't ready to face all that till he came under John's authority. Now, I personally have two areas that are very different to each other of anointing on my life. And I discovered this um, years ago when I grabbed a Bible and jumped in my ute and went up on Mount Taylor and spent a day just hanging out with God and allowing him to speak into my life. And he spoke to me out of Isaiah 49. And in there it says that I felt this was what God was calling my life to, to do. It says, To restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. That's Christians that have been hurt and damaged in church life. And that is part of what red gum will do because what's, what's on me gets on you. Sorry about that, but that's how it, how it works, right? And so part of already the story of red gum is the restoration of Christians that have been hurt, often at no fault of their own in church life. But, but in Isaiah 49, God doesn't stop there. He goes on, he says, but if that's the only thing you do, it's too small. I want you also to be a light to the Gentiles, which means to, to reach people who are far from God, who have no idea. So that there's two parts to the life of this church to be an encouragement, a safe place for people who've just been, they're just, they're over church. They're okay with Jesus, but they're over church. And people who have never had any experience, that have no idea. And it was interesting when I felt God speak this to me. I shared it with my brother Ken. And he said, Oh, oh, that's Isaiah 49. That God spoke, called the same thing to me. And then I shared that with my dad one day that God had spoken to me, me out of Isaiah 49. Now he'd spoken to Ken. And dad says, Well, God said that to me too. Same chapter. There's a generational thing here. And it's it's generationally was in my dad and mum in this community, and now it's been carried, but it's, it's God's heart. It's not me. This is, this is God's call for us as a church. I said to Coral at the end of last year, I reckon it's time we start a youth ministry and that this year, which is now, would be the year we'd start that but I didn't know how. And then two weeks ago, I woke up on a Tuesday morning and I had a text message, someone in red gum, and they said, we've got a heart for youth and young adults and we'd like to put some money towards whatever we can do. That was Tuesday morning. Wednesday night, as a board, we decided that we would appoint a youth pastor two days a week and start a youth ministry now. And that's Aaron. So Aaron has just become our two-day-a-week youth pastor for Red Gum. And what's, what's, what's amazing about Aaron is that he's had 20 years of youth ministry experience. He's been part 
of five youth ministries that began from nothing. I don't know if you, you understand what it is to, to start something from nothing, but you need a certain set of gifts. You need a certain sense of power to be able to do that. Of the five youth ministries he's been part of, three of them, he's, he started them himself. And if I was looking for someone to lead youth and start a youth ministry for Red Gum, and I had all, all the people I know of in Australia, I, I couldn't find someone better than Aaron to do that. Yeah, right? And so just in the timing of everything, in the preparation, Aaron's been doing flooring, which he'll keep doing, but that's helped him, him sort of bed himself into the community. And it will probably take, I think, Aaron, maybe three years before you really hit the full fruitfulness of when you start from nothing. So it won't be like tomorrow, bang, but it's going to happen. And, and we're going to engage with our community. See, in the bushfires, our response to the bushfires, we engage with our community. And, and that was fantastic. But see, that's, that's come and gone. It's time to re-engage. And in, in the lives of... To start a youth ministry from nothing, we've got to go to people and we've got a whole town full of people with kids and youth and... So I'm pretty excited about that, Aaron. So, When we come under hoopo, under the right authority, it's not a limitation. It's actually a releasing. It's, it's a setting us free to, to fly in all the ways God created us to do. And Jesus, obviously, he did far more than John through his ministry, through his life. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a limitation to come under John. It was a release. And, and John was, was later put to death for having a go at Herod over an affair that he was having. And long after John the Baptist is dead, no longer breathing, no longer on planet Earth, Jesus is asked a question by some of the legal, religious Pharisees, the law keepers. And they said to Jesus, and it's record, this is recorded three out of the four Gospels. This is a big deal. And, and this is what, what they said to Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? And... Who gave you this authority? Where did this authority come from? They weren't worried about where his power came from. See, they studied the old covenant. They understood how authority and power worked. They weren't worried about where Jesus got his power from. They wanted to know, where's your authority? And watch this. Jesus did not say to them, God. He didn't do that. He didn't say God. Under the old covenant, God appointed prophets and God could say, God appointed me. But Jesus was introducing this new covenant. And so Jesus did not say, God. God gave me this authority. I'm still a little lost. <laughs> Just because I had this written out doesn't mean it's fully <laughs> percolated in my head. So <laughs> I'm I'm um, in this new covenant that Jesus was introducing. It's a covenant of what some people call a priesthood of all believers. It's what Peter describes. Peter, Peter in 1 Peter 2, 4 says, You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And when we unite as God's bride, the church, when we gather together, this is this new covenant. This is, this is the way this new thing works. And under this new covenant, 
in Ephesians 4, Paul points out how this will work. And he talks about the fivefold gifts of ministry and that prophets would be appointed by the church, not by God. Evangelists would be appointed by the church, not by God. Pastors, teachers, apostles, we all, we all come under the bride. It's no longer God appointed me, it's his bride appointed me. That's the authority that is now on earth. And when it comes to the question that Jesus was faced, where did you, who gave you this authority? He says to them, John. Doesn't say God, he says John. Remember John? He asked them a question. I will, I will answer your question if you can tell me by what authority John baptised. Was it from heaven or was it from man? And they, they didn't want to answer. But Jesus went to John as his authority to be able to do everything he was doing. And John is dead. When I started in youth ministry, it was Bob Boots in Bansa AOG that gave me the authority to function as a youth pastor. He was a man of integrity. Then Barry Clark came along and Barry Clark gave me the authority to function as a youth pastor. And now in Redgum, it's the board, it's the leadership team, it's you that give me the authority to function in my giftings. God created us to come to Hupo under, under. Aaron will be functioning under. That's how it works. A couple of weeks ago, <laughs> we... we um, we know a guy called Nathan McLean. Some of you know Nathan. He, he's a Bensdale boy, grew up here. And um, he leads, he's a, the campus pastor for the Southwest um, Hillsong Church in Sydney. And Nathan has done a lot of things, carried a lot of things, um, headed up all the kids' ministry for Hillsong. Now, Hillsong as a church have played a really big role in our lives. We've been to all the Hillsong conferences. They've played a big role in many people's lives. And, and yes, there's been a mess and, and it's, it's imploded and, and it's very traumatic for all those involved and, it, and, it's, and it's painful and people have been hurt and let down, all that. But God promised he'd come back for a bride without all the wrinkly bits and he will, he will refine us, whatever it takes. Well, Hillsong are still global church. There's still a massive footprint on the, on the global church and still in Australia. And the other night we heard that Nathan was preaching at the main big church in Hillsong and being broadcast all around the world. So we, we gathered Sunday night in a house out at Hillside and we had Mandy and Aaron and the boys sitting there. And, and as we're starting to watch Hillsong, this lady that heads up the um, uh, camp, what was it, City Care, yeah, City Care in, in Sydney, she was being interviewed and she heads this up and, and as she's talking I said to the boys, see that? That's Linda Lemon. She used to cut my hair. In fact, she used to live in this house we live in. And then as Nathan's getting ready to preach, I said to the boys, I know him. I know that guy. And Zeke says, you do not. I said, yes, I do. And so I got my phone out and I text Nathan a little text. And I just said, Nathan, we're all sitting in the lounge room watching you, barracking for you here in Bensdale. So Nathan gets up to preach the world and he gets up and he start, says, well, I just want to give a big shout out to Lex, my youth pastor in Bairnstyle. 
And Zeke and Jesse goes, ha, 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 and nearly fell off, nearly fell off the, the seat because suddenly their granddad knew someone famous, <laughs> right? Suddenly I'm important in their lives. <laughs> what they didn't know was that years ago here in Bansdale, Nathan was the most quiet, shy little kid and at a youth camp down at Coolmatong, I can remember when he was maybe 13, 14 years of age and I put my finger on his mouth, on his lips and I prophesied over him that he would be a mouthpiece to his generation. And how God takes a little kid to the places where Nathan is now and the influence he has, it's coming under. It's coming under. I will never get to speak to a global whatever. But see, hupo, when you come under authority, it's not a restriction, it's a release. And you can do far more than the person that first saw something on your life and gave you that authority to function. I'm going to close. Lord, I thank you that you created us to work in a community of people where we would come under, where we would hoopo ourselves under kingdom authority and it would be so releasing and so life-giving that we could flourish and we could do so much more, so much more. I thank you for that. Do you know, people in your world from Monday morning through to Saturday evening, they know if you come under kingdom authority. They, they, they will never ask you, what authority are you doing this under? What, where does this authority on your life come? They don't even know the authority bit. But they sense it. And when a centurion, a Roman centurion, met Jesus and needed help from Jesus, he realised that Jesus, he says to Jesus, I too am a man under authority. He saw that Jesus came under authority, that his power came from being under. And you know what? When we bump into people that are little lone rangers, they may have power but they don't come under authority, it doesn't smell right. You just know there's something not quite right. So I promise you, in our world, when we come under kingdom authority, our world knows. It can, it can smell it. It can sense it. And God uses you in very, very different ways when you come under, when we all do that together. So thanks, Mandy.